That's Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 1 and going all the way through to verse 20. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no room in the guest house available for them. In the same regions, shepherds were staying out in their fields, keeping watch at night over their flocks. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the city of David, a Saviour was born to you, who is Messiah the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to people he favours. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Keep your Bibles open. We'll be working our way through that section, looking at why Luke would include a story about a bunch of raggedy shepherds coming to see a new baby in his biography of Jesus. But before we do, it's appropriate that we pray. So please, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and pray that you'll help us to hear and understand what you would have us hear today. Amen. So as I was playing with the kids, who are you and what do you do are usually the first questions that you ask someone when you get to meet them. These questions help you to find out lots of useful information about a person you've just met and can usually strike up interesting conversations if the person does a fun or interesting job. Now, Jesus, he's the most famous person in history. And that means we often assume we know exactly who he is and what he came to do. But the question we get left with is, can we be so sure? Do we really know who Jesus was and what he came to do? How do we know that? Can we be certain? Well, this is where Luke's biography of Jesus comes in handy that we just read from. Luke was writing to his mate Theo. And Luke was writing to Theo to say, this is how you can be certain that everything you know about Jesus is true. And that's what Luke wants for us as well, to know, to be certain that everything we have heard about Jesus is true. And this is where the story of the shepherds come in. When we first read that chapter, maybe you're a bit bemused. Luke spends exactly seven verses talking about how Mary and Joseph went up to Bethlehem and had a baby. He then spends 12 verses talking about the shepherds. Surely in a biography of Jesus' life, we need to spend more time on Jesus and less time on the random shepherds outside. But the thing about the shepherds is, they're the people who get to receive Jesus' birth announcement. Now, birth announcements aren't that big a deal these days. They used to be a lot bigger. These days, you send out a text message and put something on Facebook. Previously, you got to take out a whole ad in the paper and let everybody know that a child was born. And the swankier the family, the swankier the newspaper that you'd get to put your your announcement in. 
Well, here with the shepherds and the angels, we get Jesus' birth announcement. And did you notice who's giving it? Verse 9 gives us a clue. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. This gives us a clue about who Jesus is because an angel is the one delivering his birth announcement. God has gotten one of his personal attendants to leave the throne room of heaven to come and deliver a birth announcement to a bunch of shepherds in a field. Now, if you got a letter from your local postie that said, a child has been born, well, that's exciting and special. But if one of King Charles's royal attendants came and knocked on your door with a sealed envelope saying that a child had been born, well, that's something a little bit extra. Well, here, God's royal attendants show up to a bunch of shepherds to say, a child has been born. Now, this should give us a clue that this child is not an ordinary child, that he is going to be something special. And then in the announcement, we get to see exactly who he is and what his job description will be. So in verse 11, we get told, Today a Saviour who is Messiah the Lord was born for you in the city of David. So the first thing we learn is that this child is Messiah the Lord. Now Messiah is a funny word. It's a Hebrew word. It means exactly the same thing as Christ, which is a word that you probably hear more often. But both words mean God's chosen king. So the angels have shown up to the shepherds and said, a king has been born, and not just any king, God's chosen king. Back in the Old Testament, God promised that one day he would send a king who would rule forever. This king would free Israel from their captors, reign in God's land and bring blessing to the whole world. And so far, all of Israel has been desperately waiting for this king. They've been moving from foreign ruler to foreign ruler for the past 400 years. The Babylonians were ruling them. Then the Persians took over. Then the Greeks came and took over. Then for one bright, shining moment, a guy called Judas showed up and he managed to kick the Greeks out of Jerusalem. Israel was finally free. This might have been the chosen king until the Romans showed up and put an end to that party, and now Herod's in control. And Herod only gets to be king because Caesar didn't want him in Rome anymore, so put him out in the furthest province he could find. The king has now come. No wonder the shepherds are so excited. God's chosen king is finally here. But did you notice that the angels call him the Lord as well? Surely if Messiah means king and Lord means Lord, the angel's just saying the same thing twice, isn't he? Well, not quite, because Lord takes on a special meaning. Back in the book of Exodus, a guy called Moses started talking to God in a burning bush. And Moses had the audacity to say to God, Hey God, what's your name? So that when people ask me who sent me, I can tell them what your name is. And God, being the understanding person that he is, answered, I am who I am. In Hebrew, that's sometimes written out as Yahweh. Now the thing is, one of the Ten Commandments that God gave his people was, Do not take the name of the Lord in vain. And so, in order to avoid breaking that commandment, most of the Jewish people would never write down God's name. They would substitute it for the word Lord. That's why in your Bibles, if you ever see Lord written in all capital letters, that's God's name right there. And so, what the angel is telling the shepherds is that this baby in the manger isn't just king, it is God himself. This king is bears God's personal name and has come to earth. Which leaves us with a rather intriguing question as, why? Why on earth would the God who created the universe want to leave his throne in heaven to be born as a child in a manger? It doesn't make much sense. 
until we realise what else the angels told the shepherds, that he is saviour. Now that means that this king, God, has come to save, well, somebody from something at least. This is where our reading from Psalm 2 can really help out. Psalm 2 paints the picture of God's chosen king on his throne ruling and it tells us what it looks like. And one verse always stands out to me and that's verse 12 because it says, pay homage to the son or he will be angry and your way will lead to destruction for his wrath can flare up at a moment. Blessed are all those who take refuge in him. This doesn't sound like a king who comes to save, one whose wrath can flare up in a moment, but he's come to save because that wrath is perfectly justified. God is king, and whenever we treat him as less than king, whenever we try to be king of our own lives and act like God doesn't exist, well, that's nothing less than treason. And treason demands a punishment. But God, in his love, stepped down into the world so that he could be saviour. So the punishment for our treason might not fall on us, but would fall on Jesus, so that we could be saved and live forever with him. You see, whenever there's a breakdown in a relationship, one of the parties has to make the first move. If you've gotten into a fight with a friend, either you or the friend has to make the first move and say, sorry. Our relationship with the God who created us was broken by our treason. And so one of us had to make the first move. But our treason made that impossible. And God being the truly innocent party who had done nothing to cause anything of the relationship breakdown, could have just sat back and waited and been perfectly justified in doing nothing. But instead, he gets off his throne and comes to earth. The baby in the manger is God making the first move, coming to us to restore the relationship that we have with him. That is why it is important that this Saviour is not just God's chosen King, but God Himself. He is coming to fix the relationship that we could not. This is why the end of Psalm 2 says, Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. He is both the King who will punish those who commit treason and the one who will save those who take refuge in him. This is the amazing story of Christmas. And in response to that news, the angels decide to gather their buddies together and sing. They sing glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace on those on whom his favour rests. The Christmas story, the baby in the manger, brings both peace to people in God's favour, and glory to God. It brings glory to God because we get to see how amazing God is, that he would leave his throne in heaven to be born as a helpless child in a manger just so that he could make the first move at restoring our relationship with him. Not because we deserve, deserve it, not because we've done anything to earn it, but simply because... He loves us. And it brings peace to people because when we trust in what he has done for us, when we accept that we could do nothing and he has done everything to fix our relationship, we have peace with the God who created us. That is how we get God's favour. We could never earn it. God's standard is perfection and Well, we're certainly not perfect. Well, I'm not anyway. And so God made it possible that we could receive his peace and his favour by trusting in what his son has done for us. 
And the angels don't stop there. They give, a, they give an invitation to the shepherds. They say, this will be a sign for you. They say, if you don't believe us, if you don't trust what we've said, go and check it out. Go and look at the baby in the manger and you'll see that everything we have said is true. And so our challenge today is go and look. Go and check out the signs that God has given us, that Jesus has done what he's said he will do, and you can be sure that he will show you, you can have full certainty about what Jesus is, who he is, and what he has done for us. Because up until this point, when the birth announcement came, the only information we had about Jesus was coming from a teenage girl who got pregnant before she was married and her fiancé. And they're hardly the most reliable witnesses in the world, particularly when they both start claiming, the baby's from God, we promise. Well, God is vindicating their story by sending the angels. He's putting his stamp on it saying, no, what they're saying is true. This baby is God himself come to save. So come, look at the signs, check out the evidence, read one of the biographies of Jesus' life, see if it stacks up. Because you can be 100% certain of who Jesus is and what he has come to do. He is God himself come to earth to be a saviour. And because we can be certain about that, we can be certain that he's done the one job that he had to do. It is finished. We can trust him with all of his promises. He's lived up to all of them so far, so we can continue to trust that he has done enough. The message of the world around us, particularly at Christmas time, is always work harder, save yourself, try better, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. The message of Christmas is, slow down. God has done it all for you. Trust him. He can do everything. He is enough. And you can be certain of that. So despite the uncertainties of life, despite all the things that get thrown up in the air when one family member is late for Christmas and suddenly the turkey's not there, it's okay, because you can be certain Jesus is not just God himself. He is God's chosen king, and he is saviour, and he has done everything we need to bring us back into relationship with God so that this Christmas when we pray, we no longer come to God as his enemies, but as his children with every right to call him Father. So on that note, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the certainty that it brings and pray that you will help us to trust that your son is enough and can give us all that we need. Amen.